Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio Lunchtime Talk. These talks are live every Friday at 1 p.m., both here in the building and live online. Hello, online. Uh, so whether you're in Bristol or you're far away, you can join in the conversation. So my name is Martin O'Leary. I'm a white man in my 40s, long hair and beard. I'm the studio community lead here at the studio. And every Friday, we throw open the doors of the Pervasive Media Studio for Open Studio Friday, where we offer you all the chance to spend some time in our space, hot desk alongside our residents and staff from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So especially big welcome to anyone who's new to the studio. Can anyone who's new to the studio put their hand up? <laughs> this bit is for you specifically. <laughs> what is the Pervasive Media Studio? We're a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. And we're a partnership between Watershed, where we are right now, the University of the West of England, and the University of Bristol, and we're funded by Arts Council England. And what we do is we offer studio space, desks, meeting rooms, events and opportunities, all for free to our residents as part of a spirit of generosity and mutual exchange. And we're a space for people to take risks with embryonic ideas and to make some time for collaboration. So a few notes before we start, please do feel free to move around. The kitchen is back there. You can grab a cup of tea or coffee or a glass of water or something. Uh, if you want to take a break at any point, we have a quiet space just through to my left, your right, through that wall just there. Uh, if you want to take a break, just pop in there. It's reasonably well soundproofed. Uh, you'll be fine. Uh, we are not planning a fire drill today, so if you hear a fire alarm, that is probably real. Uh, the studio team will direct you, but the fire exits are at the other end of the, the, other end of the studio. Again, my left, your right, uh, at either end. Um, but we'll, we'll show you where to go. Uh, and there are accessible toilets and baby change in the corridor over there next to the kitchen. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end of the talk. So if you're watching online, you can pop your questions into the YouTube chat. Lauten will be your voice in the room today. Uh, if you're in the uh, building, then stick your hand up and we'll pass a microphone around. Um, you can get news on all of our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio or at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio at Mastodon.social on Mastodon, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. And there are, there's actually a list up now. It, it's, usually we're like a week or two ahead, but we've, we've got a few on there now. Um, anyway, our speakers for today are Helen Brown and Ellie Chadwick. Uh, Helen is a user experience designer and behavioral scientist, and Ellie is a theater maker and academic interested in immersive performance. And together, they've been My World Research Fellows with Condense, working with live virtual performances in Condense's virtual stage, Studio 5, just downstairs. Uh, today, they're going to be talking about their R&D experiments with a focus on liveness and wayfinding in virtual performance. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Helen and Ellie. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, as discussed, we're going to be talking about wayfinding and liveness today. Um, apologies for the wayfinding nightmare for any of you who already went to Studio 5 before. Um, so Ellie and I are, yeah, have been working with Condense. Condense are based downstairs. Um, if you don't know what they do, they do some amazing things um, with volumetric capture. So they have a very cool rig where you can capture people's um, likeness in live uh, when they're doing live performances. So it's about bringing live experiences to audiences everywhere. Um, so yeah, they capture and stream uh, live content into 3D games and applications. So that's the space that we are working with. So um, just to kind of say a little bit about what my role um, was and what I was doing with my fellowship, <clears throat> I was focused on the kind of performer side of things and Helen was focused on well, the audience side of things. And then we had a lot of questions that were in common, didn't we? Um, <clears throat> and talking to Condense to find out about what they were interested in exploring, we came up with an R&D. Our first R&D um, was called um, Trace of Us, and it was based on a project which I was already working on with my theatre company, Sleight of Hand. We used some of the scripts, because um, essentially we had these goals where we wanted to try out theatre in a virtual space um, and look at performer and audience experience and responses to that. And so we had some scripts that I was already working with, um, and this kind of existing work in progress that was underway. And we thought, well, let's try that in this different space, in this virtual space, and see what happens. And essentially, for this first R&D, we did a workshop day and a performance day. And it was very kind of like, let's just throw stuff into the space, um, bring some performers in, work with these scripts, and see how, see how the performers adapt to working in this virtual space, see how the audience respond. And then we had this R&D performance where audiences could 
join um, in the virtual venue and watch what we've done and put together. Um, <clears throat> so my background is theatre and we were working with a very theatre-based approach for this first song, do you think it's fair to say, in terms of we just wanted to try theatre in the space and see how it worked and what the challenges were. And the challenges that we faced, um, I think, were, they were, were, as we expected, technical issues. So obviously we're trying something completely new out. Um, we didn't know exactly you know, how best to work with the technology and there were lots of things that potentially might go wrong, which we knew. Um, we were very ambitious with this R&D in terms of what we wanted to throw into the venue. So one of the things we wanted to have was projected video on the walls in the venue. And that just was too much <laughs> for the venue on that day. And so we faced some ch technical challenges in terms of not being able to kind of throw as much in at once as we wanted, as quickly as we wanted. And so I think that was really, you know, there were issues with time frame and just expectations of what it's possible for us to achieve in a brand new environment working in a theatrical way um, and yeah, starting to adjust really what our expectations were and how long it would take to kind of get all on, on the same page and understand, but you know, the huge learning curve for me working with this brand new technology um, and for the performers as well. Um, so yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so just before we get into kind of what we found, um, just to really give a bit of an overview of what we mean by wayfinding. So um, wayfinding is essentially about kind of the intellectual or kind of cognitive element of navigation, so how we find our way between points of interest. Um, so this can be the tactics and strategy that inform where we move. Uh, so motion being more like, yeah, the motoric part <coughs> of navigation, how we physically and virtually move. Um, and navigation is kind of how those two things come together. Um, when we... Um, spoke to audiences after this first R&D. Um, you know, understandably, for a lot of people, this, this form is very new for them. It's new for us, too. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, that was something that came out you know, very clearly in terms of how people were finding their way in the space, finding their way um, as, audience, as audience members, but also participants in the experience. So I think um, kind of different experiences of a lot of audience members. Some people were much more familiar with theatre. Some people were much more familiar with gaming. And I think you could tell that those expectations sort of informed their experience of that performance. Um, in these experiences, uh, audience members take on, a, they're kind of represented by an avatar, so a virtual identity in the space. And not everybody is familiar with avatars, and that can create kind of a mediated experience um, for people where you're kind of watching yourself watching something, and that's quite unfamiliar for a lot of people. Um, I think, you know, as Ellie mentioned, sort of technical issues with any new kinds of technology, there's a lot of questions about, oh, is this going wrong because it's something I've done? Is this my computer? Am I just having technical issues? And of course, sometimes that's the case, but other times it is the technology and everybody's experiencing the same issues. Um, and I think generally, you know, social behavioral norms in these spaces are still very much forming. Like we don't necessarily have ways of being, modes of being in these spaces yet. Um, and so I think what this kind of results in is that people just have a lot of unsurety about what to do. Um, what to explore, um, where to go, what should they explore. There's a, you know, definitely a time investment in figuring that out, particularly at the beginning for people who've never been in these spaces before. Um, and obviously audience, audiences can bring all kinds of technical ability. So some people are very well versed in sort of navigating with a keyboard, kind of moving around, moving the camera, whereas other people that's perhaps very new for them. And of course, this was a remote and solo experience. So it's not that you have other people there. You can ask, like, oh, what am I doing this right? How are you doing this? Um, that can feel quite isolating, I think, at times. And I think you know, what came out quite clearly from this first R&D is that this confusion um, can create a sense of a fear of missing out. So people were often concerned that they were missing some element of the experience, or they weren't experiencing it in the correct way or in the fullest way. Um, and I think what we noticed was that people were taking cues from other audience members about where to go. So if they saw somebody over there, they're like, oh, something interesting must be going on over there with a the lack of any other directional cues. They were taking cues from other people. Um, but actually doing that, seeing other people kind of having fun or watching something that you weren't watching can leave you kind of feeling a bit left out um, in what's going on. That can leave you feeling quite isolated. So yeah, these were the things that we, kind of the main things we took from uh, wayfinding in this first R&D. So yeah, just to summarise really some of the questions that 
audience members might have coming into these experiences. This, you know, where do I go? What do I do? What can I explore? What should I explore? How do I participate? Am I doing this right? Is it my computer? Um, what have I missed? Have I missed something? And how do I do that? How do I do what they're doing? So these are some of the questions that people had. So, yeah, just kind of picking up on some of those themes in terms of the, from the performer side and looking at from the performer side. Um, it's obviously some performers are used to working with, say, motion capture and things like that, and other performers it's completely new. So there's also a learning process on both sides, I think. Um, and in terms of, kind of takeaways from this R&D, um, we talked a lot about how this is a brand new mode of performance. Um, it's not a replacement for an in-person live performance. It's something brand new. It's not really theatre anymore. And although we had approached this R&D from a very kind of theatrical perspective, um, there were lots of things we took away um, from things that didn't work so well, things we thought, oh, we can, we can do something different there. So, for example, um, we had a stage and it was a very clearly delineated stage in the virtual space. So the performers stood in, the, in their rig and they performed and they were captured and they were put in this, on this virtual, virtual stage. Um, and audience members tended to just stand still <laughs> and watch and um, not interact so much. And obviously there's a lot of potential for interaction and doing something a little bit different here. So we talked a lot about how we could build on that going forwards and how you know, potentially taking away the stage and doing something different with the space would be interesting. Um, and the, this need to build on the unique aspects of virtual in-game performance. So what are the potentials here that are completely different to theatre or perhaps tie in more with promenade theatre or immersive theatre, for example? Um, we also talked about how story is created through a range of aspects. So it's not just about the performance itself. It's also about the, the venue design and the atmosphere of where you are in the virtual space. And we talked a lot about sound and how effective that can be at telling the story. Um, and then we talked about how, in terms of process, there was a lot we learned in that first stage about the potential for tie better tying together the design and engineering and the performance process to achieve more with um, all these possibilities. Yeah, so um, kind of after this, and as we were doing some collaborative workshops with the condensed team, um, we were thinking of what we might do better or do differently next time for our next R&D. And so, as many of you may know, there's a lot of um, research already been done on wayfinding in, in environments, so virtual environments and real world environments. So we wanted to use some of this and help it inform the design of the venue. So things like um, dividing spaces up into regions or distinctive parts, giving directional cues, helping people to self-locate, to know where they are in a space, um, making points of interest or landmarks easy to recognize signage, clear pathing, and just basically limiting choice where possible, so making it easier for people to know where to go. Um, but there's also the finding your way in the experience. I think that's something that is a lot more complicated because this kind of performance requires a kind of curated form of exploration, which we, you know, we were just kind of looking at, you know, at the boundaries of, really, in this. Um, and so exploration and participation in these spaces need to align somewhat with the aims of the performance, if people are going to get something from this experience. Um, and so I think we were interested in how we could help people to understand the rules of engagement, kind of help to balance the needs and goals of audience members and performers. Um, and so we did this in a variety of ways. We explored using a moving stage, roles, pre-event storytelling, things like that, to really test this out a bit more. So this brings us on to the second R&D process. So the title of this was The Crew, um, and it was, so just to run through some of our goals um, and kind of reflecting back on the things we'd learned from the first R&D, we really wanted to encourage people to move around and explore and get involved in a kind of similar way to how people might approach a game, uh, running around and trying things. Um, so that was a key goal. And then in terms of how we do that, another goal was expanding the spatial possibilities. So we talked about the regions and just changing up the space and thinking about the stage not as a, a kind of delineated area, but as somewhere where the actors appear um, and how that might move around and encourage that kind of adventurousness to follow what the actors and what they're doing. Um, also, we talked about testing out a sense of liveness. Um, so because of the technical issues we faced with the first R&D, one of the things we talked about was how to kind of make things more streamlined and what kind of experiments we could do with liveness and having pre-recorded sections that, um, because there were so many different things we wanted to bring in and cue like animations and sound and all this sort of thing, having pre-recorded sections allowed a little bit more 
freedom, I suppose, and um, ambition with that. So we thought a lot about, will people notice when it's pre-recorded? Will they know that it's not, that the actors aren't there live? Um, obviously, we would capture them in the same way. They would look exactly the same. Um, so that was an interesting thing to explore. Um, and then in terms of the process, obviously, we, we wanted to have a lot more lead-in time and a lot more opportunity to work together um, with Condenser's team um, and have that dialogue, workshops and dialogue with the engineering team and talk about venue design and functionality um, and really get to grips with what the possibilities were, what the challenges and limitations were and also what the possibilities were. Um, and then, yes, of course, because we wanted to have some recorded content, it meant that we could do more stress testing of the venue and, and hopefully there was less to go wrong. Um, but then in terms of challenges, <clears throat> we're obviously we're pushing the boundaries of the tech here. This isn't something that Condense has been doing before, that we've done before, so we're really trying to push the boundaries of what's possible, um, working across different mediums, integrating completely different approaches, thinking across kind of theatre, immersive theatre, video game, um, and that involves that last challenge about varying expectations about participation in format. So we talked a little bit about how you know, some people are coming from a theatre perspective, some from a game perspective. And um, that is yeah, interesting in terms of like, what actually is this and what are we trying to do here. So The Crew um, was a, a piece that we wrote, um, a collaborator and I wrote specifically for this venue. And um, we wanted to write it alongside the design of the venue and the design of the experience. So. We drew um, on kind of inspiration wise, we were thinking a lot about Punch Drunk, immersive theatre company, and particularly because people going to a Punch Drunk show, they wear masks, so they're almost like avatars in a sense. They've got some anonymity there, as, as you do if you've got an avatar in a virtual space. Um, and we wanted to encourage that kind of exploration in the way that Punch Drunk do. Um, thought a lot about different video games as well, and created this kind of Lovecraftian neo noir thriller, which was inspired by a Lovecraft short story. Um, and was set aboard a futuristic submarine traversing the virtual void. So in terms of the storytelling, we had immersion in the design, so we wanted to create an atmosphere immediately upon entering the venue, so we're already doing some storytelling before the actors have even spoken or done anything. Um, we also wanted participation in the story, so we had the audience kind of cast in the role of the crew. You are the crew, you're coming on board this submarine, um, fresh recruits, and all this stuff's going on, all this strange stuff's going on. Um, and then in terms of the stage, I've spoken about not having like that delineated stage. Um, so we wanted to reduce that, the boundary between actor and stage and their audience and kind of all be in the same space together. Um, and then, yeah, multiple rooms and spaces to explore. So kind of promenade style where audience were encouraged to move through. So that's where wayfinding really comes in because we had to try and guide people through the spaces. Um, mix of live and pre-recorded scenes and a use of immersive and spatial audio. So we had audio zones where we walked from room to room and the audio would shift and change, giving some sense of atmosphere. And also there were little kind of Easter egg type things where if you walked up, there were some closed cabin doors. If you walk up to those doors, you could hear like whispers behind one and different sounds. So things to encourage people to move basically and explore. Yeah, um, and when we heard from audiences afterwards, um, in terms of the environmental wayfinding that we supported, so obviously you can see these massive signs that we had, <laughs> they clear enough. Um, they work pretty well. I think mostly people could self-locate. Uh, we did have an unfortunate bug at the beginning of the experience, which was a bit of a wayfinding nightmare for us. <laughs> the actors appeared in the wrong place to where we were telling them to go, but I think it showed that people were going to the right place, but we just put people in the wrong place. So, um, yeah, I think we explored signs, you know, making things very clear. We had. Um, some more subtle cues, so we played around with kind of um, footprints, kind of wet looking footprints as a, something to sort of guide people a bit more subconsciously perhaps, and like a big sign. Um, we used kind of text and audio, so we had audio um, in terms of voices from actors and from the captain telling people where to go and what to do, very much tied in with the storytelling. And we had sort of in-game messages come up as well frequently throughout the experience. People had these two modes of knowing where they should be going. Um, I think those were made, pretty much followed throughout. Um, audiences used a mixture of both. Um, I think the text instructions probably could have stayed on longer for some people. Um, when a lot's happening at once, I think you need to account for that, that there's a lot of people are processing a lot of information at once. So the more help you can give them, the better, I think. Um, yeah, Ellie mentioned about um, audio. I think, again, that was something that we heard from audiences was 
you know, could you use occlusion more in terms of blocking sound to guide people through the space? But actually, um, having global sound, um, particularly for you know, key moments of storytelling, was really important. For people who are in the wrong place, they didn't miss the story. And for some people, they did actually just listen to the audio. They were quite happy to go along with the storytelling. They didn't need to see the visuals at the same time. Um, so I think that's quite a challenge, doing that really well. It's difficult. Um, a few other things. Doors, yeah, that was an interesting one. I don't know if you can see there's like a door back here. Um, so what we really tried to avoid uh, in this space was having places <coughs> where people couldn't go. So having some ambiguity over whether people could interact with something or go through something. But these were doors that we kind of needed to create a realistic um, entry point and exit point for the actors on the stage. So they would open and close when the actors would kind of enter and go off the stage and move to a different location. So um, they worked for that purposes. But I think we found, you know, as, as they've also found in kind of punch drunk performances, is that people were quite frustrated that they couldn't use them. They kind of felt like these doors to nowhere are perhaps a bit unfinished. And um, people don't like that. They like to know what they can interact with and that to be very clear. Um, something else, mental maps. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we were quite careful around making the space small enough to support wayfinding. So again, it's kind of reducing too much choice. We also wanted to create a little bit of claustrophobia, I think, in the sense of it being in a submarine um, and avoid, but, you know, big enough that it's not, people aren't clustering around too much uh, where the actors are standing. But I think for some people, having that kind of mental model, I guess, of a submarine or a big place, they felt like it should be more sprawling, that it should be more to explore, and that was quite disappointing for some people. So that was a challenge. Um, in terms of finding their way in the experience, um, I think we did a lot more this time in helping people to onboard to the experience. We had a lot more pre-info um, for people in terms of getting used to the controls, understanding what they were going to see, um, what it was about. Um, I think giving people enough time to do that stuff and like customize their avatar, for example, was really important. People liked having enough time. Um, I think a lot of people do, you know, but we still did have people showing up and, you know, they were customizing their avatar right there and then. Kind of an expectation that people were going to prepare was maybe, you know, I don't think you can, we could have expected people to prepare necessarily, but we helped them if they wanted to. Um, I think generally people really just wanted more in game tutorials or simulations so that they could increase um, their familiarity with the space, but also when it got to the time of doing it, being in the performance that it wasn't just super novel and they were just going around jumping on things and that they could actually have a bit more focus um, once having been in the space before. Um, framing and storytelling, you know, I think yeah, audience members really enjoyed kind of being brought into the story before the event. So we had, for example, an email from the captain that got sent to people, kind of um, giving people a role, giving them a sense of what they, the mission that they would be on um, and people really liked how the storytelling framed some limitations of the technology. So if there were kind of glitches in the volumetric cap capture, people kind of liked that that was making sense of that experience. There was kind of some kind of like meta understanding <laughs> of what they were seeing. Um, we did ask people to customize their avatar in the theme of uh, their team. So we gave people teams like safety team, communication team, but actually um, the kind of third party software that the avatars uh, are based in the kind of range of costumes weren't necessarily fitting for the theme of this performance, which was fair enough. I think people people did that, but I think people came up with quite creative uh, solutions. Um, I think generally, when we f framing, I think we f we were perhaps we could have been more careful in how we framed the experience as being interactive and like the team element. I think we created an expectation of much more interaction. Um, as you would expect in a game. So that's the, like the level of interaction that people seem to expect. And so that expectation wasn't really met. Um, yeah, and just a few more things. Yeah, giving people a role, people liked that that increased their anticipation. They were excited to meet other people on their team. Um, when we were giving people specific instructions, there wasn't any necessary uh, feedback. We weren't able to give feedback to people for the behaviors that they were doing. So that could for example, we were asking people to do press-ups, and people were doing press-ups, and they weren't getting told that, that they were doing them right. They were kind of, you know, the, the instruction was to keep doing them, so they were unsure if they were doing something wrong. Um, and I think generally what people wanted was more consequence of their role. They wanted to really have an impact on the story, and that was something that we talked a lot about, but we weren't able to actually bring to life in this performance. Um, and finally, off-boarding experiences. So, we wanted to provide a more kind of complete rounded experience for audiences. Um, but we used quite a lo-fi, you know, not particularly inclusive solution, which was Facebook. We had a bit of a Facebook page, a post-event page. Um, but I think, again, the framing of this 
trying to keep it in line with the storytelling, we were kind of saying, oh, there'd be like a, you know, go to Facebook for a debrief. I think people perhaps expected some finishing of the story or some further content that we didn't deliver. Um, so I think generally, you know, the in-game chat function, the opportunity to connect with people during the experience was something that came up and um, has come up for condenses audiences as well in terms of a feature they would like. Yes, I'm talking a bit, I'm talking a lot. So I mean, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's wayfinding. Um, talk briefly now about liveness. So yeah, I think both Ellie and I were really interested in what liveness means in these experiences. Um, and many of you may be familiar with um, Philip Oslander's uh, work on um, the evolution of liveness, so um, digital liveness particularly. So what counts culturally as live changes in terms of technology and our relationship to it. So there's this idea that uh, technology can kind of make claims on us and it's our relationship to that technology and this kind of sense of liveness that creates the quality of the feeling of liveness. Um, so I think for us, um, yeah, we're interested in, you know, what, what kinds of liveness experiences matter to people, what comes up when we talk about liveness, um, what happens to liveness when audiences are also participants in a multiplayer game, so they're kind of like the main character in their own story as well. Um, yeah, as Ellie mentioned, does a performance need to happen in real time to feel live, and what cues do audiences use to determine liveness as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want to speak on this, Ellie, if you're sick of me talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it, as we kind of predicted, people couldn't necessarily tell yeah. um, which bits were, were live and which bits weren't live. Um, some people, yeah, were unconcerned. And I think, again, there was, there was a bit of a divide, wasn't there, in terms of some people were there from a very sort of theatre-going background and some people were there from a very game, yeah. gaming background. Some people were both. And um, I think that what mattered to them differed quite a lot. Mm. <laughs> the interactivity element and the, you know, the impossibility of going through certain doors and things was very frustrating, I mm -hmm. think, to the, the game, more gamer audience. Um, and the theatrical audience had more of a sense of kind of etiquette, maybe, in terms yeah, of like wanting yeah. people to, audience members to behave and watch the performance at times, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because we had these pre-recorded performances, but they weren't. There were some like little mistakes in there, and we kind of just kept them as is, as we would have done if they were performed live. And there were a bit was a, some stumbling over words and things, and that in itself suggested liveness and made it feel like it was happening in the moment. Mm. Um, the delay is interesting because there's a 10-second delay um, between um, the performance and then you know receiving it. So there. There are some challenges in terms of being able to interact because any interaction is delayed and then breaks that kind of illusion. So it's what what you do with that and how to how to create how to use other tools maybe to create a sense of liveness and create interaction in a um, cre be creative in terms of like how how you feel it's interactive mm. in the moment. Yeah, this is something I've missed there. Yeah, no, I think yeah, you know. Claims to liveness is a question, really. You know, are these are these claims to liveness in this experience? I think um, for a lot of people, when we're talking about liveness, this sense of something being one time only came up a lot. You know, there's no pause button; it's not on-demand content. So if you leave it, you'll miss it. Sense of urgency around that, um, and having a visual countdown to a specific date and time can kind of cement this sense of something being alive. Yeah, as Ellie mentioned, the imperfections. So getting a line wrong or somebody coming out of character. Even if that isn't, even if that's pre-recorded, that can still make something feel live. I think really interestingly was um, kind of audience avatar behavior. So um, there was a sense that other people, other avatars with names were moving around in some kind of a realistic way. And um, that gave a sense that other people were there now. These were real people experiencing this at the same time. And that's actually quite different from our first R&D where some of the avatars um, were spawned in and they were kind of, they all looked very similar and they just had like numbers instead of names. And there was a bit of uncertainty about whether they were non-player characters or whether they're actually real people. Um, I think volumetric capture, that was interesting. So one person was really liked that um, they could see the actors' faces moving and talking and that gave a real sense, I guess, of liveness in the moment and that they were, the actors were visually distinct from the avatars, um, which for other people didn't like didn't like that difference, that contrast was actually quite um, immersion breaking for them. Um, yeah, and as Ellie mentioned, like real time moments, like interactions were, are still seen as very valuable. 
um, I think, in terms of real-time interactions with actors. felt like that was probably like the gold, gold standard of proof for liveness, um, in that people could either impact the story, the outcome. There was some real kind of improvisation or unscripted reactions to what was going on, what somebody was doing in the space. Um, and then real-time interactions with objects. So we tried to simulate this interaction with, um, so everything was queued, so we weren't, you know, there, nothing was kind of automated in this experience in that sense. So doors were opening and closing on queues, animations were happening on queues, audio was happening on queues. And so, um, yeah, in this experience, we weren't able to have real uh, kind of click interactions like you would expect in a game, but I think people were looking for that. That was something the kind of context set you up for, I think, that yeah, we kind of gave instructions to the different teams to go yeah. and do things to, to try and get people to be actively moving around the venue yeah. and checking the airlock was closed and things like that. And I think people wanted to be hands on in yes, the, in the virtual world with that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, just, you know, drawing on kind of the, the live music shows that Condensed does so well, that, that personal interaction from artists is a big draw for fans. That's really important um, in the moment, kind of calling people out, noticing what they're wearing or what, how they're dancing. Um, yeah, and this is um, kind of a lot to say in this one, really. But I think for both of us, we kind of had a growing sense of how much the audiences can really impact an experience of a performance. And that's this audience is having these kind of dual roles of being a spectator, but also a participant or even an actor. Um, and so as much as people maybe want exploration, they want interaction, they want to run around, they want to jump on people's heads or run on beams or whatever, that can distract from the actual performance for themselves and for other people. So people getting in the way or kind of breaking the immersion or breaking the sense of being in the moment in the performance. Um, similarly, avatar names... Emotes, so emotes are kind of these um, standardized kind of behaviors or movements that um, people could make their avatars do, like press-ups. Um, if that feels incoherent or inconsistent between people, that can be quite jarring sometimes. Um, different people, again, talking about different audiences, people going with different goals and different boundaries. So people from, notice people more from a gaming background would kind of jump on people's heads, jump around, do that kind of stuff. Whereas for other people, that didn't feel very nice. <laughs> they didn't like that kind of interaction with people. Um, and etiquette and freedom, I think, again, this is like a central question that we have in that, you know, if you can do anything, does it matter what you do? That was a question that somebody posed to us. And this sense that, you know, do you feel responsible for how much you can impact other people's experience of a performance? And how do you create this kind of sense of, I guess, respect or accountability in these spaces um, without it feeling like you're policing people's behavior. Um, and there was some willingness for people to hand over control. So, you know, having a reduced selection of costumes or having cut scenes where they were actually, where their avatar would actually be immobile and be kind of forced or kind of, yeah, they couldn't move basically. And they would kind of, so they wouldn't miss any elements of the story. So there was some sense of people willing to hand over some control, yeah. I don't know, Ellie, if you had any more on that one. I think that covers everything. Yeah, I, thought, I found it interesting, the suggestions about the cutscenes um, and thinking about, because one of the things we talked about in the first R&D quite a lot um, when we were doing the workshop was what this, what this form of performance or um, <clears throat> what this cultural product is. It's sort of like a blend between game, theatre, but also film and cinema. And um, the fact that somebody mentioned it would be nice to have more cinematic moments with like, these cutscenes where you have to kind of get involved in the story in that way mm. was interesting. I think mm. it's just a blend of all different things. Yeah. Yes, and that brings us to the end. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? Uh, yes. Hold on. Just can you get your microphone? <laughs> You're not going to be able to hear yourself, but it's for the folks at home. Oh. Hello, folks at home. <laughs> um, I'm wondering where you drew the audience from for these. So, yeah, so it was kind of a mixture, really. My World, so the My World group, so Vanessa, um, our producer, so she was, and also, um, sorry, I can't remember your colleague's name now, was helping us, Liz. Vanessa and Liz were helping massively in terms of spreading the word throughout the My World network, um, but then also we have our own kind of creative networks. I don't know, thinking about yeah, that. Yeah, so I was kind of spread it through the Sleight of Hand Theatre Company networks and um, yep. yeah, it went out through the studio. And things, so. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully far and wide, we think, <laughs> yeah. 
I'm curious to know more about the technology boundary edges that you were pushing and what kind of things were you playing with and yeah I'd love some examples um, yeah uh, so I suppose one of the things was the fact that we wanted to, so we shifted from R&D one into uh, from just using a space that was there and was built into having a, a space built alongside the storytelling and alongside you know the development of the script and everything so during that we, we had this workshop with um, folks from Condense and talking about all the different possibilities of which like we had well I don't know if you want to talk about that imagineering kind of process oh. and how we, what we did <laughs> yeah well yeah we had a collaborative workshop with Condense and we were thinking of so imagineering is sounds very cheesy essentially it's about kind of so Disney do it so it's about basically kind of creating these magical worlds and pushing the boundaries of um, imagination and engineering, but making things that could actually work. So that's how we came to be thinking about all the ways that we could help people through this, navigate through this experience. So um, some of the things were more like low tech, weren't they, in terms of like avatar roles and things like yes, that. Yeah. But, yeah. And, yeah, kind of giving them the story, a bit of the storytelling beforehand. But in, in that workshop, there were so many different ideas and then it was a case of going, okay, which ones are actually achievable and what are our mm. priorities. So sound was really, trying things out with sound was really one of our priorities. We thought that is a way to, it's so atmospheric, you can do so much atmospherically with sound and it's also a way to kind of guide people through the experience. So that was one of the priorities. One of the priorities was um, making the stage invisible and making the actors appear in different places. Um, so we, we honed down our priorities, but there were so many different ideas um, about like creating rituals for the audiences to do, like what are the rituals of theatre and what could be the rituals of this experience mm. and things that were talked about which, um, you know, we didn't necessarily have the resources, the time, the budget, the kind of manpower to do mm. this time around. But um, it was really, yeah, a case of what are, our, what are our priorities and where can we start to create something that is somewhere between theatre uh, theater and game mm. and that is an, a, an experience that, no one's really going to have had before because of the sense of like there is liveness there is sort of almost playing with what liveness is um there is we, well we wanted more interactivity that was something that you know we, we would love to do more of um but there is some sense of um, being involved in the storytelling um and impacting the world um but as i say because of the the time constraints we couldn't like have you know buttons people could push that could do things and stuff like that but that's where yeah. I suppose our thinking was going. Like how how yeah. can we bring these things together, game, theatre? Definitely. And I think um, what was challenging in that, you know, yeah, we don't, making a game as a whole, you know, we weren't making a game, we were making an experience. And I think it's important to share that, I think I did as well, that it was all on kind of manual queuing, like production, essentially, what you'd imagine in a theatre is happening behind the scenes in real time. And so these are a lot of buttons. The lot, there's a lot going on. So we were putting a lot on the condensed team. It's like, oh, can we do this? Can we do that? And it's, you know, people kind of pressing like 50 buttons at once <laughs> when things are going on. So um, that was really, you know, really mm. challenging. I think the moving stage yeah. as well, that was a the huge moving one. stage. And mm. also not because it was new to condense it new to us. We didn't know what the t whether it would be it would handle it in the sense that would it, would it just mm. crash because we're trying to do so many different things. We yeah. built this venue, which was kind of, you know, bespoke for this storytelling and then we're trying to move the stage around we're trying to put all this audio in we're trying to put all these animations in we've got the volumetric capture there we've got live streaming we've got all these avatars coming like is the venue just gonna go no nope, give up <laughs> <laughs> so that was where I suppose we've kind of felt like this is this is pushing the boundaries in the sense that it may just not yeah. not even run <laughs> yeah just kind of yeah fun <laughs> So w was the venue built in a game engine, and which, if so, which game engine was it built in? Unity. Unity, yeah. Unity, yeah. <laughs> I've got a question um, from a kind of um, devising point of view, because the actors are kind of in a blank canvas, aren't they? They're in a sort of rig with no, not necessarily props and, and things around them in the same way that you would in a more traditional sort of theatre setting. And I was just wondering what the sort of key takeaways were from that in terms of the sort of ultimate, if you could do it again, what would be the ultimate devising process with actors in a space like this? Um, yeah, I suppose, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, actors approached it very differently depending on their background. So that was quite interesting that we had one actor who was very well versed in doing loads of motion capture stuff for games. And he kind of was really into it and kind of dived straight in. And I mean, everybody was great. Um, 
but I think some people were a little bit more, uh, they needed something to root them in the space. So um, some actors asked like when they were trying, to, because we had the, the crew, the audience is the crew, we wanted the delivery to be quite you know, open to the imaginary avatar audience who weren't, you know, they couldn't see necessarily when we were recording things. Um, so they needed something to, to focus on and kind of root them in the space. So I think one of the key things was being flexible and kind of adaptable to different, what, different people's needs and, and how people work differently with the technology because it, to some people it was completely, well, it's, it was new to everybody, but to some people, you know, they had experience of motion capture and to others it was, they didn't. So mm. I suppose flexibility and kind of being able to um, adapt and also giving time to adjust. So one of the things I think that takeaways for the audience was giving them time to adjust to the space and explore and try out the emotes was really important before getting started on the storytelling. And similarly for the performers, building in time in the devising process just to play around with mm. being in the space and looking at seeing themselves as volumetric captured yeah. avatars, you know, in the space and um, and get to grips with just where to stand and like, you're, you know, if you stand here, you're going to be cut off and like all of yeah. that kind of thing. Um, building in plenty of time for exploration and play was really key. I think, so I think the, do the doors was really interesting because that actors had to think about where the doors were and they would practice that so many times. Like, and you know, we had, we had tape, this tape yeah. and it was like, all right, so I do this and I go that way. And actually it was a very, quite a meta experience for them because they could see themselves on the screen with a 10 second delay. So it wasn't this kind of instant feedback of what they were doing, but having being able to see themselves, I think, in the rehearsal time. Yeah. Because I think a lot of creative ideas came out of that, a lot of kind of improvisation yeah, in definitely. terms of... And that was something rehearsal. we learned from R&D 1 to R&D 2, was building time for well, yeah, yeah, trying out going through doors and all mm. that kind of stuff, and then being able to go over here and then look 10 seconds later, OK, that's what it looks like, that's yeah. what I'm doing. Mm. And just, it's just a completely different way of, mm. of working. And then in terms of yeah, devising, um, trying stuff out like that brought in all these ideas and um, uh, potential things that you know things that looked much better than what we imagined and yeah. you know, all that kind of thing. So that was very much part of the, the process. Mm. A question online? Yeah, I've got a question from Lindsay who asks. Um, I have a question about the physical location of the audience. You mentioned it was a solo experience. Were they at home or in separate spaces? And was the onboarding part of the narrative slash script? Yes, so it was a remote experience. I, I can't say where people might have been. I think um, people had tickets. They would log in on their, on their device. We encourage people to log on the device, which would be probably a laptop or a desktop. I do know some people who um, logged in with other people they knew, but they were in different spaces. Um, and they were like messaging each other, trying to ask them how they were doing something. Um, so yeah, that's, what, that's as much as we understand in terms of uh, where people were, but yeah, we assume people were at home. It was a Saturday, um, yeah, logging in that way. Do you want to talk about the narrative elements of the, mm. the onboarding? Yeah. Yeah. The onboarding, yeah, so, um, could, yeah, can you repeat the end bit of the question? Uh, the other bit of the question was, was the onboarding part of the narrative slash script? Right, yes. <laughs> um, so one of the ideas that came up from our workshop early on was that we wanted to of build in this story pre-storytelling before the live event itself um, and get people involved and get people excited for the experience but also give them some key information and we thought that if we do some storytelling around that they might be more likely as well to read all the stuff about designing your avatar and um, what emotes you can use and, and how what the controls do and then be a bit more prepared practically as well to kind of go into the experience so um, Helen mentioned about the captain's message that went out to people. It was sort of welcome aboard to the crew, and this is the situation. And um, it, it gave that kind of yeah pre storytelling. We also had a little kind of video trailer of the captain speaking, and a little bit of a um, look at the venue in this video, um, which gave people a little bit of backstory before they came aboard the submarine. Any other questions? Can I follow up from that question from online? Um, I was I was wondering because we, when we um, do projects here, uh, um, I'm going to rephrase. Sorry, you you mentioned punch drunk, punch drunk. Of course, people buy a ticket. They they kind of know what to expect. A sort of a famous company, people are quite invested from the moment they've bought their ticket. Um, 
just from doing R and D and stuff in, in kind of in the pervasive media studio and beyond, it's always quite difficult to get people to open those emails before they arrive. And I'm just curious whether you had a lot of people opening kind of those things beforehand, if you have any data on that or not, because that it's was, sort of yeah, a really hard, hard nut to crack. We don't, we don't have data, <laughs> we don't, no, we we don't have, no, we don't have data. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not on open rates, but um, we can assume that, at least from the people we spoke to, yeah. everyone got the information that they needed and they were yeah. invested in I do customizing think, yeah. their avatar and I they were excited few, about doing it. Yeah, yeah, people were excited. I think there were some people who did kind of miss the emails until fairly last minute and there were a few people like you mentioned about who came in and like oh we can customize our avatar yeah. and then we're 10 minutes late into the actual experience so mm. um it is a challenge i think to it get is yeah it's a lot of platforms that people need to get their heads around yeah. and i think it's especially giving enough R &D, time it's yeah especially if it's r&d so yeah. i think in, in general people find the ticket booking that part of the process was quite straightforward and i think um that user experience was good and mm. I think yeah what we so we shared some videos beforehand about like the controls and like the different emotes yeah. and we had some custom emotes for, for this specific experience so that was like I was saying like press ups and what else were we doing saluting yeah various saluting. things that were kind of yeah. going along with the story and they weren't included in these tutorial videos up front and I think people were like oh this is like extra stuff I, I need to know I didn't know this and so yeah People were, re were watching the videos, I think, and that yeah, was, yeah. yeah. And it's, because it's all so new and we're just try we're trying so many things out and then for the audience as well, it's new. Um, there's a, such a learning curve with anything like this, isn't there, that over, over a period, well, like with Punch Drunk, obviously they're hugely famous now. Everyone knows what to expect. You put your mask on and you're going to explore this crazy, you know, intense world. Um, and here, people didn't know what to expect. So, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of information to throw at people, a lot for them to absorb, and yeah. then quite a short experience to actually be in the venue mm. so yeah it's a challenge <laughs> you go. You go. <clears throat> um why i asked about the where the audience was from is it, i'm curious if you think any one particip participating had a sense of like uh true anonymity and did you experience anyone kind of trolling the whole thing like trying to subvert it i, I mean some sort of sub a bit of some <laughs> behaviour, yeah. Like I think jumping on people's heads. Jumping on people's heads. I think that was the most sort of a aggressive avatar behaviour that's allowed. I think one one person did say that they were doing that because that was the only kind of interaction they could have with other people. So maybe if there was another more pro-social form <laughs> <laughs> avatar interaction available, maybe they would have done that. But you know, I think that's that's kind of what I heard more from people with a gaming background, where that's quite normal in gaming environments to do that, and it's not. Yeah, perceived. And, yeah, and yeah. it's just perceived differently in terms of what's normal. But um, yeah, I think people jumping on stuff or just spamming, pressing buttons a lot. Yeah, and doing the emotes again and again yeah. in weird ways. Yeah, so there was a bit of that, definitely. Yeah. And yeah, I guess I'm still really interested in the limitations of the technology, but I guess from a different angle, was there anything that you felt like intuitively would be fine? Like, oh yeah, sure, we can do that, right? And then when you got there, you're like, oh, no, this is an extremely complicated process yeah, that's going to crash the computer. Well, I'm trying to think of an example. I think queuing, I think that, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. yeah. I think we're accustomed to, like, yeah. oh, in-game messages, sure. You know, it's all automated. So you think, you know, but there's, we weren't able to do loads of kind of software development coding. Like, that stuff is expensive and takes a lot of time. And so we were thinking, oh, we'll just have these... Yeah, messages these here and there up. and text you know then that's simple, yeah. you know one or two people just like okay when do i do that? and it's also keeping an eye on the audience behavior because it was very much seeing okay are people in this space now do we press play on this part when do we move the stage when do we open this door yeah, when does this instruction appear that kind of yeah. yeah and it was manually put in yeah you know copy and paste go on the yeah. instructions so yeah yeah <laughs> so some of the things in theater that are we're so used to being able to do like spatially like just oh do that here switch that here actually the technology the digital technology hasn't been able to isn't able to emulate that i think it it can i think it's just um us thinking that it's maybe easier than it was right. yeah so i think it's just a, it's, yeah it takes more time or, yeah. yeah and there's room for error i think that's also it you know if we'd made a game and everything was functioning based on behaviors and clicks and it was automated obviously that's a whole different thing and i think but when you're in the experience you i think you because you're so used to seeing kind of notifications or instructions in these kind of environments you assume that it's maybe a computer doing it but it was a person doing it and so i think that was a real you know that was a challenge I yeah, think. yeah yeah definitely one more at the back. 
Uh, Josh would like to know, was the experience controlled with a mouse and keyboard, and was there any guidance on the controls? Yes, it was controlled with a mouse and keyboard. Um, and there were um, instructions based on controls, I think. So we sent those out ahead of time. There is also a screen that, once you're in the experience, you can access the menu of controls. But we did find that actually people, some people weren't able to access that. I think it's pressing escape. And um, yeah, that was some feedback. Not knowing how to get that screen up. Some people did it accidentally. Some people didn't. So I think generally the feedback we had on the controls was that they were very intuitive. They're very much kind of like modern gaming uh, controls. So yeah. Could you explain or explain a little bit more about the methodology to gather all the feedback and comments from the participants in the experience, please? Thank you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we had um, for these R and Ds. So we had two uh, separate focus groups. So we had um, yeah. Uh, in the first one, we had a, a group of people, various different backgrounds, different industries, came together, and we had a kind of schedule of questions. Um, about the experience and how they found it. We used that, um, as we've said, to sort of develop what we were going to do next, have a, work a design workshop um, based on some of the findings. And then for the second one, we did a similar thing, new questions for the focus group based on the things that we were testing out with this experience, so more around like liveness, uh, interactions, the roles, these kinds of things. Um, and I think that was actually, you know, it worked really nicely because because it's a social experience and people actually didn't get the opportunity in the experience to talk to each other. It generated quite a lot of conversation and there's a lot of points of difference and people's sort of memories treating other people. And I think that was a really that felt like a really valuable way to collect this data. Um, we also had a survey, a qualitative survey for the last R&D as well. So people who weren't able to uh, join the focus group could feedback on some of the major questions that we had. So, yeah, very much focused on gathering kind of rich qualitative data at this point rather than kind of coming in with too many hypotheses about what's what. So we're just learning quite a lot. So that was, I think that worked pretty well, yeah. Any other questions? If not, then I think we'll say thank you to it. <laughs>